It looks the same. I don't get it. Yep, not a not a difference in the world. It looks like a remaster. Watch the originals. They haven't aged that well in terms of drawing quality. My friend who's on a stage. Graphically, it's too old. I don't want to watch this. Yeah, so I, I think when it comes to remakes, you have the one side that simply won't like it because it looked different, 90s animation to best, back when things were hand-drawn, not this digital garbage, even though anime is still hand-drawn and a huge amount on paper. And then you have the ones who rate the visuals purely off how clean something looks. So the original doesn't even get a chance. You could have one of the best directors during that decade, which Kenshin did. But that film grain, it, that's a step too far. This looks old and therefore equals bad animation. So yeah, let, let's put that aside and look at the stuff that matters, like how less uh, shiny Kenshin's hair looks. I, I don't know, whatever I usually ramble on about this channel. So the long haired ginger has had a whole batch of looks. There's the OG stuff by Hideki Hamasu, then someone else took over when Kenshin switched studios, then Yanagisawa for the Trust and Betrayal OVA, sort of a realistic take, then another designer for the Reflection OVA, then the remake of the Kyoto arc. Yeah, surprise, surprise, a, a, a new character designer. And so here we are, 2023, back again with the 50th iteration, and this time with a take by Terumi Nishi. Now she's definitely not a newcomer. Nishi did the character designs for the Jojo Bizarro show, Diamond Unbreakable. Also has credits on One Piece, Death Note, Darling and the Franks, the first season of Jujutsu Kaisen and the movie. Even a little bit of work on Initial D during her early days, which isn't relevant, but all this to say she's been around for a while. And it's interesting to see the differences in her designs to Hamasu's. For me, I think one of the biggest is the jaw. Hamasu's designs depicted the face with a long and pointed style, even for younger characters like Yahiko. Whereas Nishi, it's shorter, more rounded off and wide, quite similar to the manga. Then the mouth and nose are much smaller with Hamasu's, very similar to the manga in that respect, while Nishi's are larger. But besides some minor details, they're not widely different designs and approach, say to Hagiwara's for the Kyoto arc remake, which was definitely the biggest stylistic swap up yet. You've still got the two-tone shading, the big eyes, big hair. I honestly think both takes have strong appeal. But yeah, to the episodes. Now honestly, the start of the 96 version, I think visually it's as good as it gets. Such great framing. Kenshin's constantly positioned with all the carnage behind him. Whether it's bodies, flames, well, especially flames. Even when he walks away, there's still a trail that follows his path. Eh, kinda symbolic. Then layered over, there's the punchy colours with rich red hues. It's all very distinctive imagery. Now with the new version, they're like, stuff the original backstory, let's bring Saito in was kind of unexpected, especially considering one of the main selling points of this remake is, is that it's closer to the source material. Even the 96 version for all the liberties it took roughly stuck to the manga's format here. Also maybe a bit of context, um, Saito's appearance wasn't actually until chapter 48 and in the original anime it was episode 28. It's kind of like if you introduced the Red Ribbon Army in the first episode of Dragon Ball or something. Anyways, it does give an opportunity for some action, which is the main pull in the remake's case instead of impactful direction. And it's solid stuff, the actions are quite readable and strong, some good posing. Stylistically, it's nothing particularly out there, but it's a fine way to start. And the detailed character art for Saito, big ol' thumbs up. Oro. Oro? Yeah, no, no Oru funny face, minus 10 points. So animated Takaki Wada handles the introduction between Kenshin and Karu, and it's as good of an opener as you can get. Karu is particularly quite animated. You can see animation principles like overlapping action with the clothing and hair. There's also a strong range of expressions illustrated by Wada, like with Karu's reaction or Kenshin's gradually getting more and more goofier to the point he's pulling out Sailor Moon poses. It's very expressive and fun, and it tells so much about these two just through the visuals alone. The character animation sells the clumsy aspect of Kenshin perfectly. It also communicates Karu's independent, strong-willed nature equally as well. Like when she chews Kenshin out, Wada through the principle of spacing, spaces the drawings far apart to make the movement erratic and forceful. And a still drawing of a character just blankly staring at a sword doesn't convey any of that. For the most part in the new take, the only thing that moves in this section is the lips. Now, we'll say I am not going to pretend everything I praised was the standard Kenshin episode, because by the second one for dialogue, it's very much a lot of stills with a little bit of movement here and there. But the difference here is that this is the first interaction between the show's two key characters. There's an extra level of importance, and yet in the remake, it couldn't feel any more like your everyday anime conversation. 
Now, there's this thing called storyboards that can help some of that. Take early One Piece. There is next to no animation in a lot of the dialogue scenes, but directors would often get creative and frame conversations in interesting or sometimes intense ways. But here, e even the storyboard is flat and eh. In the original, there's a lot of tight, tilted camera angles used like when Karu charges forward or Kenshin slips. It's purposely done to give the audience little information, so the actions feel unpredictable and thus sudden. It brings a sense of excitement to the scene. But again, in the new take, it's very straightforward and open in how it presents things. And look, I, I can definitely appreciate the good character art. This episode isn't short of that, but that only goes so far. Anyways, moving forward to the action with Monster Man. In this case, storyboard good. The original anime, much like the manga, the guy is looking down on everyone, but for the remake, the director Yamamoto really exaggerates his stature by having him completely tower over, so props there. And nice use of colour for Shot Karu as well, probably a, a bit more appealing than the old dated inverted colours. Two thumbs up. The animation, it's again fine. The clashes and both are impactful, all the bright sparks contrasted against the dark night sky makes for some cool imagery, but the rest of it is just rudimentary in the remake. Like on the fullback, the motion is linear, while in the original there's a nice arc. After the second hit, there's a full range of expressions. As Karu hits the wall, the hair is loose, the head moves separately in relation to the body. Then the animator goes to the effort of doing an animated zoom in. It's great stuff. Remake, limited expressions, the whole body, even the hair, all sort of move together at once, creating a, a stiff motion. It simply lacks nuance. And to make a long story short, that's this whole, whole thing in a nutshell. Let's take direction for the original episode, handled by Kazuhiro Furuhashi, regarded as one of the top directors of the 90s, still kicking around, directed Spy Family, and one area of his work that truly immerses you into anything his finger touches, is how he treats background art and the environment as something alive and not just a flat pretty object. The usual anime formula for this area and, and this episode is pretty simple. This scene is at nighttime. this scene is at daytime. That change in time isn't something the audience sees, but it's a sharp visual cut, rather than an observable transition. And the latter is what you constantly get throughout Furuhashi's work. It, it seems so simple when you realise it. But boy does it help in creating a distinct atmosphere between scenes while in the most natural of ways. Furuhashi's involvement, particularly in the uh, Gone vs Hanzo episode in Hunter x Hunter, is a great example and, and one that I'll gladly bring up again. Now in that one there was the inclusion of a day cycle. It starts off around midday and gradually the sun shifts before setting into a vibrant afternoon. The manga and the 2011 take tell you that time has passed. Furuhashi shows it. It's also a clever visual cue to frame the importance of this moment. Up until that point, the environment had been soaked in a cold, dark palette. It's a brutal beatdown and the colours accurately reflect that. And by the end, when Gon displays his resolve, the victory, it's bright, it's warm. And there's a similar touch in this episode. For the beginning of a conversation between Kenshin and Karu, it's afternoon. And throughout there are small details like animated shadows to show the sun setting with even little heatwave effects added. Keep in mind, this is the era when a lot of those effects were created through actual photography. So stuff like that isn't the easiest to pull off. There's also the sunlight slowly fading off the windowsill, small additions to the drawings like highlights added to the skin or rim light on the hair, which is then gradually removed as it gets darker. Even the values, that's how light or darker color gets by the way, subtly changes. And by the end, it's dusk. It's such a nice eye for detail, but more importantly, immerses you into the conversation. And such realistic touches sit all throughout this episode. Honestly, they sit throughout the series at large. It's that depth that Yamamoto, on the other hand, doesn't bring at all. Even the storyboards, as I've shown, rarely have it. For example, take something as fundamental as layering. Like, look at this. Karu and old man here, door here, then more characters here, then bushes, and then a wall, and so on and so on. It's a simple way to give a sense of visual depth to a scene. Then with Yamamoto's, it's... Uh, and I'm sorry if I sound negative, I, I genuinely enjoyed watching this episode by the way, but the thing with Yamamoto is that he's a series director, he holds one of the highest creative positions on the show. They're usually meant to be your best or at least close to it out of your regular episode directors, like that's, you know, sort of why they're in charge. And to make things more confusing, 
He's not some new guy that got a promotion too soon. Yamamoto has been around since the 90s, regularly did storyboards for Bleach, worked on Attack on Titan, Ghost in the Shell, the, the, the TV series that is. Storyboarding especially is his thing. If that wasn't clear from the million and one times he has been brought on a series to do it, and yet that experience just doesn't come through. And keep in mind, this is a high priority one, like first episodes are meant to be your stronger entries. Take those of shows like Trigun, Soul Eater, One Punch Man, Mob Psycho, Fire Force, and the original Roroni Kenshin. You want to leave a good first impression so people will actually tune in again. And no surprise, the teams behind them are usually the most talented on the production. So it makes me wonder what the quality of the regular episodes will be for the remake. I mean, maybe if you have like a celebrity tier guest animator or director on, you might get something stylistically memorable. Anyways, I'm, I'm rambling on now, probably should move on. Uh, <laughs> So, the final showdown. Honestly, it, it's good. Definitely one of the better parts of the episode. The staff actually extend the fight out a little more than the manga and the original animes take, which, I don't know, maybe I'm being affected by shonen brain, but I think it makes for a slightly more engaging climax. And considering everything I've said about like the 96 version thus far being more animated and nuanced, you know, blah blah blah, the shoe is kinda on the other foot in this case, as the fighting is surprisingly limited in comparison. And the most 90s anime thing possible, with quick camera pans across stills and flooding the viewer's eyes with a billion impact frames, even the art is a little more expressive in areas. For a Hashi storyboard, it still trumps though. The action is framed through a good variety of angles and just generally interesting ones too. It's also got great sound effects that kind of mask the lack of movement. I love how Kenshin leaping into battle sounds like a jet taking off. Sword effects are really dramatic as well. The sound design is more grounded in the remake, but for me personally, it's a little less distinct because of it. And maybe this is my bias coming through since the original anime was my first experience to the story, but I kind of prefer its take on Gohei. The manga and the remake treats him as a basic thug that is only interested in doing the basic thug things. Switching it up and giving the guy a backstory, that of a former student from the dojo and one seeking revenge against his former master's family for paralyzing his thumb in an effort to prevent him wielding a sword ever again. I don't know, I just find more interesting than we want to sell your dojo for money. But yeah, that's the main stuff. As I brought up earlier, the greatest selling point I think of this adaptation and, and probably where you'll find most of the praise, maybe the only praise for some, is that it's more faithful to the source material. Strip that away though and it's just your standard shonen anime stuff. And it seems some people are just happy to see their favourite series back, so no hate there. But I struggle to say it will come close to the visual depth of the original or much depth at all. Anyways, that's enough from me. I think I've almost lost my voice. And of course, thank you especially to my patrons. Please support me over there. But with that, thanks again, and I'll see you later.